Good afternoon, this is Peter Grunwald, and uh, Peter is here at the Spencer's Machine Learning Group at, uh, I don't know what CWI stands for, uh, over time. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Amsterdam, and also Professor of Statistical Learning. Um, there's probably other stuff I can say, but uh, from my pers personal perspective, uh, I came to know Peter through his book, Machine and okay. MDL. DMDL principle, um, which I believe it was last summer or two summers ago, I started trying to read, uh, say trying to read, because I got so far and then I had, I found that I had to educate myself yeah. more, but I'm trying to make progress too, but, but it certainly got me very, very interested in machine you know, minimum distribution principle, so I'm uh, very happy to have you. Okay, well, thank you very much. And thank you also, uh, and everybody else, for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here. Um, so there, there's a little something here, which is that, um, so I used to work a lot on minimum you know, description next, um, wrote a book about it. Um, but then around six years ago, I started working on something else, which is related, uh, as we will see, but still, because most people don't know minimum description, they don't know information theory, I don't sell it that way. I sell it in a different way, which actually I noticed has caught on a lot more in the statistics world. Uh, so I insisted to talk about that as well. Uh, and those are so-called E-values and how they uh, obtain to evidence. So basically, and then when I prepared the talk, I thought, okay, but 35 minutes is too short. I'm just going to talk about high-level thing, what are E-values used for, not really what they are. Uh, so the first half of the talk is going to be a little bit chaotic. Well, these are people working in the dynamic system, so I guess that's okay. First about this any type of methods that I work on now, and then I'll say a little bit about NDL because that's what you invited me for, and I will make the link between. Uh, these are former current members of my group, and so uh, I all more or less uh, try to force them to work on these e values for the next years. So, what's going on there? Does anybody know if you this is Cyrillic, maybe? It's Leonid Levin, he's a very famous computer scientist. He brought us the P versus NP question, considered the most important question in uh, computer science. Uh, that was 1973, and in 1976, he wrote, he wrote a much less known paper about something uh, which we call the uniform test of randomness, which is a very awkward name, and it wasn't exactly clear how the mathematics fit that word. Uh, and that was it was something like an alternative to the p-value, but uh, then not very much happened. So 2019, when independently several people around the world got the idea to give this concept a name, uh, they call it the e-value. Uh, and um, so the e you have to think of it as something which gives you evidence about whether a hypothesis might be true or not based on the data. So it's a little bit like a p-value. Uh, and you use it to do testing and to get confidence intervals, just like classical confidence intervals or more generally uncertainty estimates are often based on using p-values in a specific way. You can also use values for that and then you, can something, you get something called an anytime valid confidence interval. And that's a lot more robust than a uh, standard confidence interval. And I would argue that we should all, I'm pretty radical at this, ditch the whole idea of confidence as we know it and move to any time valid confidence. <laughs> so uh, what happened in 2019? So there were four people, four papers within five months appearing on archive. We were the first, I'm happy to say, although we call these things S values and then the name turned out to be taken. So second paper called them E values and we call them E values as well. These have now all been accepted to major statistics journals. Um, but it was uh, four, four years ago. And we now there are hundreds of papers in all the top uh, statistics journals. There have been two workshops. Uh, many people around the world work on it, but the most active groups are actually, by far the most active group is the group with, of Aditya Ramos at Carnegie Mellon. And then uh, I would consider myself the number two here. Um, mm -hmm. We also publish a lot on it, but not nearly as much as they do. And so uh, and I was allowed to do some advertising. So uh, let me do advertising by proxy. Uh, Aditya was much younger than I am. Um, years younger. Uh, actually, this year won the IMS uh, Young Career Award, which is kind of the award for young people in statistics for exactly this work. This work. So it's really. Uh, so what is this about? Um, well, to explain to you what it's for, let's first talk about what are problems with classical methods of testing and uncertainty quantification. And I think 
this is going to be relevant to what you all are doing. They're extremely brittle. And this holds both for Bayesian and so-called frequentist, more orthodox methods. I'll only talk about the frequentist methods here given the time, but you have more or less. So this is not a Bayesian frequentist thing. This is a general. Um, so what is this brittleness about? Um, so I'm going to talk about the simplest setting where it occurs, non-hypothesis testing, which is very important uh, in the medical sciences, for example, in the psychology. You have some hypothesis. You call it a non-hypothesis status quo, right? You're seeing coin tosses and the status quo is to just a pair coin. It should be around 50-50 number of heads and tails. Uh, or you test a medication. Treatment is a new medication. Control is a placebo. You test it on various people and all hypotheses. These people have, for example, still the same blood pressure or something. And the uh, alternative hypothesis would be that there is some difference between them. Um, so the simplest possible test, I'll just repeat that here so uh, that I can be a little bit more formal, but of course, this is really the simplest thing you want to do, a lot more complicated things. What's called the z-test, and then you have uh, random variables, x1, x2, etc., and you assume they are normal with a known Gaussian, a known variance, it's already a bit unrealistic, but let's say known, just variance mm -hmm. one. And then your null hypothesis would be that the mean is some mu zero, usually that's just zero, and the alternative would be that the mean is not equal to zero. And then you get some data, you get some outcomes, and you want to test the null hypothesis. And the most typical or the classical way to do this is p value base. So how does it work? You say in advance, so in advance is important, uh, that you're going to test, for example, on n patients. In our abstract view, you get n data points. And then you calculate a p value. And so that's defined relative to your null hypothesis data. And you said, so also before, and you have to set some level alpha. We usually set it to 0 0.05 for historical reasons. Um, but um, it's not, this is also not an issue. You often hear, yeah, this alpha is arbitrary. That's not the issue here. So let's say, let's just assume we set some alpha. Um, and then if the p value is smaller than alpha, normally that means that something, a predetermined effect has happened, which has probability less than alpha on the null hypothesis. If the mean is mu zero, then you would not expect that event. If it happens, you reject the null. Basically, you conclude there is an effect. Um, and otherwise, you accept it, which means that at least for you now, you don't have enough evidence to conclude there is some. Um, and uh, in this example, you can actually uh, reformulate this without explicitly mentioning p values, but they are there. This is a formula which I guess most of you have seen. Uh, you look at the average of the data, x bar. This is what you want to test. Is it mu zero or not? And you reject the null. So you say, like, I have sufficient evidence that it's far away from mu, that it's really not mu zero, it's too far away. If the average minus your null hypothesis is larger than uh, around two standard deviations divided by square root of the sample size. Why do these things, uh, um, uh, why do, are these things the same? Well, actually this 1.96 is actually, if you go to the right or to the left, it's two and a half percent of the distribution of a normal. So if the null is two, then, uh, let's say this would be mu zero more generally, and the distribution of your, of your data, one data point looks like this, and the distribution of the average of the data points, uh, if you multiply by square root, and it looks again like this, and basically you reject if it's like, if you're in the tails at 5%, so you say the probability that it happens is five, I've seen something, the probability that it happens is 5% or less, that's sufficient for me to reject. But this is not without its issues. And uh, so, Best illustrate them, let's suppose uh, you do this, you're in the data science team of a hospital or tech company, where they also use this all the time. Um, but your boss is impatient because you have to recruit patients, they're very expensive. So at N is 50, your boss already says, well, but we should already have a look at the data. Perhaps we can already reject the null, and save a lot of money, right? If the effect is really large, we should already be able to see it. So you do that. And you find that this is actually smaller than alpha already. It's already 0 0.01 at 50. So you reject the null. You stop. Is this an okay way to proceed? I see several people saying no, and they're quite right. This is absolutely wrong. And you might consider it p hacking, although in anonymous questionnaires, scientists, uh, scientists, 55% uh, say have in an anonymous questionnaire said that they actually have done something like this in the past. Um, but it's wrong. Why is it wrong? Well, the whole cornerstone of this theorem, which was laid down by Nyman and Pearson in the 1930s, everything this is built on is 
to make a guarantee on how often you make a mistake. You say, okay, we're statisticians, so we're going to make errors. It's inevitable. But this alpha is going to be the level we deem acceptable, the percentage of error we deem acceptable. So the idea is, if you always set alpha to 0 0.05, and you're a statistician, and one day you're working for a hydrologist, another day you're working in a hospital, you do all these statistical tests over your life. And in the long run, when you retire, you can say, well, I, the number of times I did a test that that was true, but I rejected it anyway, said so it was wrong, was not more than alpha. Uh, of the time, over the alpha percent of the time. That's the whole idea of this theory. But that only works if you say beforehand exactly you specify at what moment you stop uh, analyzing the data and what you say if you do that. And if you violate those rules you said beforehand, you actually make the probability that you reject the phenomenon too larger. Basically, before you, you made it so that exactly if you have 100 data points, you will make a mistake after 100 exactly 5% of the time. But now what you're going to do is at 50, you're really going to look. If you see something which might happen by accident, you're already going to reject and it becomes strictly larger than 5%. So you do not have to guarantee anymore. You promise that you make a promise you don't keep. So that many people have realized, but this is a problem because people do have this tendency to peek at the data. What? And now this is something that not so many people know. Unfortunately, even statisticians often know this. It's actually a lot worse than this. So let's assume the same setting again, uh, but also let's peek at the data. You know that that's not allowed, but yeah, it's your boss, so okay, we're going to do it. But no, well, maybe if we don't see that it's a peak on the small alpha, we can just go on, and then there's nothing wrong. And indeed, let's say that in this case you find that it's very large than alpha, but you can't reject and you tell your boss, hey, we didn't see anything. Let's just go on until we're at one hundred, right? And then we can. Now the question is, is this okay? You might already guess the answer. This is also not okay. And this is really pretty bad. So I like to put it like this. The classical statistics is a little bit like quantum mechanics because you, merely by looking at things, you already destroy them just by looking. But just by peeking at the data, you already destroy the validity, alpha guarantee, even if you don't act upon the data you actually saw. Right? So even if you see data and you say, well, with this data, I'm not going to do anything. The very fact that there could be some data for which you would do something is already enough to make this overall probability, because probability talks about counterfactual things, larger than 5%. So just the very idea that you might look, and then even if you look and you don't know anything, it might already kill you. Um, so it's very simple. Very little. And you can see it very well. I put the grid on all back here. So then classical statisticians, they know this, but they say, well, people just should just not peak, but I'm not buying into that. We, we want flexible methods where we can stop at any time we like, either because we like the data or because our boss tells us to, and we don't know why our boss told us to. And we also might want to add data. Anytime we like, we should be able to add more data and adjust our conclusions. And that's what you can do. And of course, because people have not done Done this, there's this thing called replication crisis uh, in the applied sciences. And this is, a, there are many reasons for this, definitely not only this. There's also publication bias, but this is one of the reasons, I think, why there is this replication crisis. That people are way too optimistic about what p values mean and then what the people do. That you should redefine it or abandon the whole framework. And it's even, you know, it's even been a petition signed by some famous statistician. <laughs> rise up, whatever that may mean, but what we do is <laughs> try to replace it by something else. So how does that work? Well, so I'm going to show this to you. Uh, I'm not going to give a formula here. I'm just going to show this to you by an example. And the example is not a test, but a bit more complicated, a confidence interval, because I can make a lot more nicer picture if I do that. And it's essentially the same what happens with confidence interval. So what I drew here is the same setting as before. We're testing whether the mean of a normal is mean zero or not. But now actually we don't test a particular value. We actually want to estimate mean zero. We just want to know what the mean is. And we're uh, making 95% confidence intervals around it. So in this case, I sampled the data from mu is seven. So we sample data from the normal distribution with variance one and mu is seven independently. And at each point in time, I output the confidence interval, the standard confidence interval, which would be valid if I would have said beforehand that I want to look exactly at those data points. That standard confidence interval is completely consistent with what I said before about testing. 
that actually always is, is the average plus or minus almost two divided by square root of n. So that's what's drawn on the y-axis, the red band, right? So at 100, you basically the same set we talked about before. Data came from seven, but the average was somewhere here. It's always in the middle of the interval. And this is like the, the average, which is the middle plus or minus of one point nine six divided by square root of n. It's actually, you don't, square root of n is too slow to, you don't see it very well, but I think in the next slide, here, I draw this on a logarithmic scale. Oh. Yeah, on a logarithmic scale, you can clearly see it gets narrower and narrower. So that's the classical thing. It doesn't work because with confidence intervals, we have exactly the same problems as these. Why is this? This is just a single run. That's the kind of thing which happens in a single run. Um, so actually, this is actually a good question because that's one of these. So in this, you, this is really a single one. We did not cheat or anything. And if you do single ones, you often see things like this. And what you particularly see is that, so this is where the data comes from, but uh, like here at 150 and then again here and here, and then in this whole area, you would actually exclude it. You would exclude it, exclude it, the true thing from your interval, which is something that's, supposed to happen only with 5% probability. But so if you do this early peaking and you're interested because you're, what you really want to know is, is seven in there or not, and you stop as soon as seven is not in there, then actually you can show your guarantee to stop some. You always find a point. So it's actually not probability 5%, it's probability one mm -hmm. if you keep going. And so this is where the any time valid confidence intervals. So, uh, Standard any time confidence interval for this problem is uh, between interval. See, it's a little bit wide. And uh, this has the property, the property that we desire. You can look at the data at any time for any reason, because the probability that this true thing will ever be out there, will ever be excluded, is 5%. Ever, no matter how long you go. It's like forever. You take a maximum over n from 1 to infinity. So this is a lot more stringent than having it at a fixed sample size. That's why it's called anytime valid. Some people call it always valid. Like you can look for whatever reason, because you like the data, because you don't like the data, because what else you saw. The probability that you will find the true distribution in your interval remains always above 5%, uh, above 95%. Yes? So does this mean that if you they work at it, you're going to uh, reject the hypothesis uh, with sufficiently high probability? Yes, you lose something in that sense. If you do it once, then you get, uh, like, if you would, let's say you would use the green one and you would only use it at times 100, so the original one wouldn't have be valid. Then uh, as a rule of thumb, uh, you actually lose, so the actual probability that you make a mistake is then not 5%, but 2.5%, more or less than that. So you, you there at least, of course, a price to pay here, uh, which is that, uh, and, and you can see it here with this thing being wider. That is uh, uh, the price to pay. Um, and you can actually, here's so the standard one. Like Bayesian entities depend on priors, but the priors have a very different role from priors. If there's Bayesian statistics. So this is, for example, another one you can choose, blue one. So there you have some kind of can play around with it, but this one is worse for small samples and better for intermediate ones. But the standard one would give you a width of, there's a logarithmic factor making it a little bit wider. The classical statisticians would say you have less power. But you can actually win that if you're really interested in rejecting a particular number as fast as you can. You can actually win that back because you can stop early. So if you look at how many data do I need for it to get a certain conclusion, then it gets very complicated because in the worst case, you need about 50% more data. In a certain average case, you need about the same, but sometimes you need more, sometimes you need less than with a classical one. <laughs> uh, you had a question? No, no, not yet. Okay, not yet, okay. Um, so now I realize that in many, this is like, really, uh, uh, so we're using now, for example, for clinical trials where we want to go on and keep sampling, uh, getting, uh, recruiting new patients and so on. You're often working in situations where that's not the case. And you could even not 
if you really think about it, like I think it was, for example, a geological work that's something you can't really specify a process for which you can think that what you actually measure are random outcomes of that process according to the rules of probability theory. So you do it anyway. Uh, but I would think that, okay, then maybe all of our statistical methods are guesses, but this is definitely better and more robust than a standard approach. Because what is definitely not the case is that your data, that like when you, when you get a data set thrown at you from some researchers, it was definitely not the case that they said beforehand, we're gonna look at precisely 100 plant species and things like that. It's usually a lot more messy. And I think you wanna take that into account. This brings me to the second part. Um, I will now change of uh, tech, but I was invited for this. And it, this does relate a lot more to what was said in the, in the morning. Um, so minimum description length is actually, it was originally a method uh, of learning from data, statistics and machine learning that was devised in the 1980s, mostly by one person, Jörg Marissen. Um, and uh, the basic idea is that, uh, so it comes from information theory and indeed it's about data compression, but it would be too simple to say that this is just a form of optimism laser. It's, uh, you can argue, of course, about that for ages or years, whether it is or it's not Occam's razor, but I will kind of avoid talking about that. I will just say that the, in its own terms, the original motivation came actually from Pomodoro complexity, um, but that has all kinds of computational problems and there's some kind of unknown concept and so on. You want to think of something that you can use for finite sampling. So the idea was that if you have regularity in sequence of data, you can at least informally use the irregularity always to compress the data. Um, so for example, if you have a sequence of 0, 0, 001 repeated 10,000 times, you can definitely compress that. I actually have just done it for you, right? I give you one sentence of natural language, and which allows you to losslessly describe the full sequence. Of course, there's a lot of background knowledge going in there. So formal language, then you also have to specify the language itself. It does make it a bit more complicated. Uh, but then you try to kind of start from scratch, forget about classical statistics, and you uh, try to build something on top of this. Mostly used for model selection. So you have several models for your data. And you pick the one that allows for the most compression of your data. Make it precise in the moment. So now that this, what I mean by model, which is the simplest case, is the same thing as hypothesis testing, what we just seen. Like one model is it's normal with mean zero, and the other thing is it's normal with a different mean for the t test, anything like that. That would be covered by this. But the idea is, of course, that you want to then use it for much more complicated problems where uh, one model would be, for example, what we saw in Alex talk this morning would be a, a model with five states and the other one with six states, and you're in the regime where maximum likelihood still overfits. Um, so uh, if you look at the data, the more complex model always wins, but that we know in practice that's probably not gonna be a good thing. So you want to have some kind of compromise. And then of course, you also want to use this for models with thousands or even 10,000 of parameters. You have a number of them, most countably many, and you want to select one or a subset of them based on how much they compress the data. Um, and this was actually also originally intended, uh, Rissenen did not believe in the concept of a true distribution. Uh, so he has this uh, quote, uh, where he says, he said, in the end, you just have the data. Somebody throws the set at you. You have to analyze this. And then if you look at what happens in expectation or things like that, it's like you, you're making a lot more assumptions than you actually should make. I'm not sure I 100% agree with that, but that was the original motivation. Um, but to make this well defined, of course, you must be uh, clear what you mean by compression. And uh, the way this is done is you associate each model with a code for losslessly encoding compressing data. Um, and because codes are via graphs and equality inherently inherent inherently linked to probabilities, at some point probabilities do come into storyline. Um, now, what does universal mean? It's actually a strange word, and we'll see more of it. Forget about that word for now, we'll come back. 
And so now I'm going to explain to you how to do that. So you have two models. Think of it maybe two different hidden Markov models with a different number of states. But when I say model, I mean the parameters are not specified, not fitted yet. Let me just say either it has, or maybe it's a, a deck, two different decks for the same problem. So you have all the arrows and nodes, but they have a different number of nodes, different arrows, but probabilities associated with the nodes are not yet specified. You just look at the general structure and you want to compare if you want to test that. Um, so if the model is really, so usually the model will have many parameters and then every parameter instantiation defines a probability distribution of the data. So it's a set of distributions. In the simplest case, it's not. Like in my normal distribution testing case, this, the, uh, the thing I tested as a null hypothesis actually was something statisticians call simple. It only contained one distribution as a simple model. In that case, how you associate a code uh, a model, if it's just a single distribution with a code length, is very straightforward. You take the so called chain and final code. So, and that codes every sequence of data, the number of bits, which is equal to minus the logarithm. So, this is logarithm to base two uh, of the probability that this distribution assigns to the data. And if it's continuous data, you can take the density because at some point, discretization thinks about densities, they, they cancel out of everything. It doesn't really matter. Um, so, uh, this is, of course, well, there's no time to go into this, but this is actually a very deep result. Basically, the start of information theory, more or less. Uh, Shannon had it more or less as 49 paper, 47 paper, and then Croft in his master's thesis really showed that you can always make codes which for every possible, for every distribution, there exists a code with exactly these lengths. Well, you have to round up to the nearest integer. But if you get more than a few data points, those differences are small, so small that information theorists actually always talk about idealized codes, where, such as real numbers. Um, and then the second thing is that this code is, you can have, of course, many uh, codes um, for the data. And the one which expected, which minimizes the expected code length among all lossless codes is the length width. It's the one with these lengths. And so then the expected length on the distribution is expectation of minus what probability, and that is, of course, uh, the entropy. Right? We've seen it this morning. So the entropy is, is a very concrete thing. It's the uh, minimum expected code length you can get um, for a distribution if you use the optimal code for the distribution. Um, so this is an aside. It's actually not related to the remainder of this talk, but I just, I, I couldn't resist when I saw you here this morning, uh, uh, because this morning I heard, in, I think in both talks, entropy was connected to predictability, which makes sense, of course, if you have like entropy, if you have this entropy for the Bernoulli in the corners, you can perfectly predict. I just want to kind of get you even more out of your comfort zone here, because there are many other notions of entropy with exactly that property. Like this is, for example, the zero one entropy, like this, this is the square loss entropy. Essentially for every uh, scoring function for predicting data you can come up with, you can have an associated entropy. Um, uh, and that is, uh, well, the important thing here is that in some sense Shannon entropy is of course special and it's often the one you want to use. And definitely if you want to go into thermodynamics and things like that. But there are many problems where other entropies are actually more suitable. And these other entropies often have very similar properties to Shen entropy. They're still different, but they have similar properties. Um, well, let's see. Uh, uh, so back to this NL principle. So if we have a simple model or hypothesis associated with this code, but now the interesting thing is, of course, if the hypothesis is large, okay, all uh, hidden Markov models with five states in a certain configurations, so they have many parameters. And what you do then is, is and this is what is called universal coding in theory, for every possible instantiation of the value, parameter value, if that would actually be the true one from which the data would be sampled, then this would be the optimal code length you could get. But you don't know which is the true one. So now you want the code such that the expected difference between the code and you actually need. And the best thing you could have needed if you, if somebody would have told you this is the thing you should use because this is where the data comes from, you want the difference to be small. Um, codes with this property are called universal, which I find a terrible misnomer because universal means 
The universe is your model, basically. So you have no matter what parameter instantiation in your model is actually responsible for the data, you want to be have a short code like no matter what it is. So you should always be close to the best you could do for that one. So you want to be universal relative to a very small set, namely your model. Um, so now, once we have a way of doing this, and that, for example, we have just two models, we simply look at the data, we calculate two code lengths, and we pick the model for which the code length is the shortest. And that we say that's our best hypothesis for the data. Um, so how do you make these universal codes? Well, the original way that Rishnan thought of already in 1978 was to basically discretize the parameter space mm -hmm. and then code the data in two stages. Basically, you first code a sub-model, which is just a particular parameter value, and then you code the data as if it would come from that parameter. And you get these things. It's like this is the number of bits needed to code this, and then this is the number of bits you need to code the data. Yeah, under the assumption that it would come from here. So this may be sub-optimal because the data and you can think of this as something like a complexity penalty, because clearly the bigger your set of parameters, the larger this will tend to get. Um, I'm going to skip this. Just, uh, never mind about it. There's some connection to Fisher information. There. Okay, let me briefly just say that one thing. So this is also code length, and by graph inequality, we know that for every code, there's also distributions such that the code length is equal to minus log of the probability density of the outcome. So you can also write it as minus log W, where you can think of W as something like a Bayesian prior. But this looks very much like Bayesian maxima a posteriori maximization, where you would not minimize this, but maximize uh, the thing exponentiated times minus, so it would give you kind of the same thing. However, there's a crucial difference because this thing is actually not derived using prior information usually. Um, because it's, it's never thought of as something you could kind of sample from, right? It's purely an artificial construct. So then you get very, you come up with these priors in very different ways as a Bayesian would. And the priors you end up with actually also often don't look really like Bayesian priors. But technically it's very similar. This is one way to do this coding, universal coding, but it's actually not the best way. There's something which is, looks even more like a Bayesian thing, so-called Bayesian coding. You take a prior and you kind of average all distributions, and then this turns out to be a code also that you can associate with that in a code and it looks like this. I mean, no matter, I know that it took me years to understand this, so uh, but it's just to give you some idea that you can do this in different ways. And then a very nice one is you can also use some estimator, for example, maximum likelihood, you keep estimating the next data point based on the previous data points, and you add all the logarithmic prediction errors that also gives you code length which then is a bit similar to cross-validation-like notions. So there's three, at least three ways, actually, there are two more of doing this. And what's interesting is if you have like <laughs> regular parametric models, like Markov chains, for example, and they have k-free parameters, and these three methods asymptotically give you the same thing. They give you minus log probability of the data, but now according to the maximum likelihood estimator, which maximizes the probability, plus something which is related to the number of parameters. The constant is then different for three different models. They all have a different constant here. Um, but just to say that there's not one way of doing it. Yeah? So that's true not just for polynomial models, but any uh, nonlinear curved exponential families, which is quite a lot. But when you start talking about chaos and so on, then this definitely does not. So for it's actually very, for, for mixture models, it's actually. Uh, not really true. And mixture models are also used a lot. So if you have a mixture of Gaussians, so you have these things with them, then it, it's, you get still some, but it, this K becomes a very complicated thing, not just uh, a number of parameters. So it is, I would say when in doubt, it's probably not true. It's, <laughs> uh, exponential families are used a lot, but there's so many more models of families. Um, so now, if you're going to use this, you have two, let's say you just have two models, okay, you pick, more, you pick the one which minimizes the two part length. Then, uh, so if you have really a lot of data, then you will actually pick the one which minimizes minus log probability according to maximum likelihood. So notice that this thing is just the higher the likelihood the smaller this is. That's the minus log of the monotony, but you have this complexity penalty. 
minimum requirement. So this is the same thing that the basic information criterion would do. Um, but in a way, this is unfortunate because, uh, so in my book, I have this big box where I say MDL and BIC are not the same thing. And I still sometimes have to review papers where we say like, we use the BIC, which is also MDL. It's just, this is a specific type of asymptotics where we like N go to infinity and keep K fixed. In practice, when we use this, it really gets interesting because we get different things from traditional hypothesis testing. If K grows with M, and this is just, we, we really have to calculate these code lengths and we cannot use this approximation. It could be completely off. And there's actually a lot more to this complexity than just the number of parameters. It depends on uh, lots of things. Um, so it is useful to notice, but don't take it too seriously. Uh, you can say something similar about MDL and base factor model selection. It's similar, but again, not the same, especially when your models get really big, non-parametric, then it kind of diverges. They become very set, very different. Um, uh, then there's also, this seems completely unrelated to cross-validation. I just want to point out that's not true. It's, uh, it's not the same, and it's sometimes the different results, but it also has uh, interpretation, which is a bit similar to what happens in cross-validation. There's no time to go into this. But of course, you can use it for the same kind of problem, so you would like to know how. Um, so now I get back to the punchline, like how is there any connection between part one and part two, and the fact is there is, and definitely in my mind, because how I got to these anytime valid methods was through MDL. Because there were certain things I was kind of worried about. I, I liked it, but sometimes it did not give very good results. And uh, I also I wanted to I would say, okay, there's the statistical testing by Nyman Pearson. How does it relate? Um, now, it turns out that if you look at this code length difference, it determines which model you select for your data. So if you think there are just two models, you could think of this as just rejecting the null or accepting the null. Um, and so the bigger the difference is, like if code length for H0 is much smaller than for H1, you have a lot of confidence in rejecting, uh, actually, no, let's say we look at rejecting H0. So H0 is your null, code length of H0 is a lot larger than with H1, then you will reject H0 because you can compress the data less. And if the difference is big, then you are kind of confident in rejecting. Now, if you exponentiate this code length difference, you get something which is called an E process. E goes and E process are more or less the same. Forget about the difference here. And E processes are the basis of any time valid test. How is that? Because for an E process, you have the following inequality. Um, this is any distribution in your null hypothesis. So you assume there's a null hypothesis and it's a set of distributions. What I want is that if I take any of them and you assume the data sampled from them, the then the probability that this will ever get large is small. So what this means is that if you reject the null, if this thing is larger than one over alpha, alpha 0 0.05, let's say it's larger than 20. So you look at data, it keeps growing, and when it's larger than 20, you say, now I can reject. The probability that this will ever happen if the null is true is bound by alpha. This means that you can use this for any time value testing. Because if the null is true, then the probability that you will ever see this getting large is small than alpha, no matter when you look. You can look based on the data and still probability remains smaller than one. Um, so therefore, you can use this. But so here's the thing. So um, if the null is simple, then this thing is in process. And you get these type one error bounds. And you can clearly relate the data compression story to the statistical story where you want type one error bounds or confidence intervals. You can use this to get valid confidence intervals. And I am not as radical as Rissen, and I still think these things are very useful. If in the case that there's really a data sampling model, it's just a sanity check, then I should get something which is valid. Um, but the problem is that, um, let me just first go. So any E process can be interpreted in terms of the coding difference, but the converse is not true. So if I have an E process, I can kind of work backwards and think of it as a difference between, so I take, of, the, of this S, I take minus logarithm. If I do that, then the outcome can be reconstructed as a difference between two code lengths, one associated with the null, but one with the alternative. So it's always like MDL, but the opposite is not true. If I 
do we do the MDL thing? And the null is not simple, so the null itself has many parameters. And I do this exponentiation, then I don't always get an E process. I, I always am I'm only guaranteed to get it if the null is simple, which is a very strong restriction. Even in the T test, the null is not simple. Um, but now it turns out that if you don't just use the codes I just told you, but you add an extra ingredient, like an extra kind of uh, condition on your code, you cannot just use arbitrary codes to associate models with, but they have to have some special uh, property. Then it becomes one on one. Then MDL and this E process theory are, become the same thing. It's just that this basic idea of universal code, like any code is fine, which allows you to be close to the code, which is best if you would have more, more knowledge. That's kind of too simple. You need another way of associating models with codes, which is a bit more subtle. And uh, again, I'm not going to kind of tell you what it is, but it's one thing. So maybe some of those people who know information theory may have heard about something called Kelly gambling or Kelly betting. It's like you can think about the whole story of Shannon's story in terms of bits. But if you exponentiate, you can also think of it in terms of money. And uh, you can think of uh, a code as a strategy for investing money. It's really a one, it's very beautiful. It's a one-to-one -one, uh, um, correspondence. And uh, the thing is that this interpretation in terms of betting, if it's a standard universal code, it breaks down. But if you have this extra condition on top of it, then it also becomes not just data compression, but also bet betting. And then everything works. And essentially, so this whole theory is, I, I, I am, I'm always kind of, uh, people say, yeah, but this is so complicated. It's actually easier than traditional testing. It's just that you spend many hours learning that. If I would have that many hours, I could explain to you everything in terms of betting because it's 101 and it's really uh, like the basic intuition is very simple. So why can we have any time validity? It's really literally the same phenomenon as that in a casino, if it's a real casino, so think about a real casino as the null hypothesis is true. And a faulty casino is a casino where if you're clever, you can make money by investing in strange sequences of outcomes. So the thing is that no matter what investment strategy you use in a casino to reinvest your money, money in different outcomes, if it's a real casino, the probability that you will get rich, that you turn $1 into $20, is smaller than 1 over 20. And as I guess you all know, it doesn't matter when you go home or what rule you use for going home. The probability remains small. Even if you say, well, I will go home if it's Tuesday, 5 o'clock, and I've seen three reds in a row, because then... I will do better now. It doesn't make any difference. No matter what's your rule for going home, you will not get rich. No matter what your rule is for stopping, if the null hypothesis is true, you will not see a large value. So it's really the same matter uh, here. Um, so that was basically the story. Uh, thank you very much. So here's some take home. So you know, there's a price to pay, right? We get wider confidence intervals than the classical methods, but I think it's worth it because it's a lot more robust and we can be flexible with data, which is what we want. So thank you. Uh, okay. Very close to time. So I think it's okay to go. Oh, cool. Um, you have a little bit question. You have like two hours or so that I'm very familiar with your four papers. And I would like you to contrast or make a connection to them. The one was what, and the other is. Um, Fiction thingy, then um, is there like a connection to what you showed there or a difference? And then the other was Glenn Schaefer, which I'm not so familiar with, but he has the stem to Schaefer theory of evidence. And is that also? Dem to Schaefer is not connected. Dem to Schaefer is totally unconnected. Or totally, but uh, I think almost totally unconnected. Fourth? From formal prediction, which is also a big thing now, also about quantification, is Okay, at a high level, uh, Volodya Vovk is someone who does things 20 years earlier than anybody else. And two of these things are conformal prediction and e-values. <laughs> so he did both, even though they're a little bit different uh, already in the 90s. And so I, I made it appear here as it would be completely out of the blue in 2019. Uh, everything happened at once, but Vovk was always, always writing about it. I think the big problem was that he didn't have a name for it. Um, 
Um, and uh, so in that sense, Pop is very good at these things, but there is a, a bit of a deeper connection as well. And actually I'm trying to work it out now in more detail, which is that you could, um, basically everything you can use a p-value for, you could also do an e-value, you use an e-value for and you get more robustness. Conformal prediction is now based on p-values and you could do it with e-values and actually Vovk has also thought about that, but kind of dropped the idea again because it's, um, uh, so with these conformal confidence intervals, they look a bit like posteriors. And if you use e-values instead of p-values, they become upper probability, so they, they look a bit uglier, but I think they would also be better. So, and Volk actually has also thought about that. So yes, uh, it's all about robust uncertainty quantification. Andreas? Yeah, thanks, I was really interested, and I think this fairly would really solve the practical problem. I was wondering, could you extend this to kind of algebraic data where they can build with functional algebraic equation structures that you can use? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I don't think it has been done yet. So IID is not kind of is that that's, that that those those are orthogonal things to this. Uh, when I use IID just for simplicity, so correlation. Uh, I don't think there is people have actually done let's say st standard ARMA like things things like that. But what has been done, for example, is um, it's a very nice paper about. Uh, something called the hosmer lemus hope test, which is about if you have, for example, different weather forecasters who are usually highly non-stationary and you want to find out which is the best one, uh, you can actually use this methodology. So you can make an e-value which somehow, you don't even have to know, like uh, p-values can never be used for that because then you would, would have to know what they would have said if the weather on previous days had been different, but you don't need to know that for e-values. So, I'm pretty sure it can be done. The big problem is that we don't have enough manpower to write, to work out all the details and do the software. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, no, but it's, there, there's no inherent obstacle. Also, yeah, sorry. Uh, in, in practical problems, you have the early stopping problem, but you also have the problem that you don't actually know what the variance is, right? Yeah. It's estimated instead from data. Right, so we have a very- That you're early stopping. So we have a very nice solution to this. <laughs> so that's basically what happens in the t-test that's in, where you say like, I don't know what the variance is. So there's a t-test version of this where actually, um, okay, if you, so the, the right thing to do from this theory's point of view is uh, to use an e-value in which the evidence is a free, in which the variance is a free parameter. And you can do that and mathematically uh, it, in this particular case, it turns out to be the same to put uh, a right higher pro So uh, instead of a likelihood, which I have to now simply just use probability of the data, you don't plug in the variance, but you use a right higher prior on it, uh, which in general, this improper priors can give you crazy things. But here, this turns out to be just the right thing to get this anytime validity. So this particular case can be done. I mean, in general, it's of course, the more nuisance parameters, for every nuisance parameter, you have to think of something in a way, this is the problem with the original MDL, that it had no solution for that. Like, it was not clear how exactly you have can deal with these nuisance parameters. And here there's like, well, I would have to give you the definitions so you would see. Alex? Uh, yeah, really nice talk. I guess I'm just <clears throat> struggling a little bit with the uh, description of the data, uh, you know, based on, you know, what language you're using, what tools you have, whether you're using specific methods or something else. It seems like the description would be very good. It's actually a very good question. That was one of the main issues with the original MDL. That for these simple parametric models like Markov chains, exponential families, there is a principled way. But uh, as soon as you get into more complicated stuff, it's, it is unclear. Uh, and again, yeah, I'm sorry if this sounds too much like an advertisement, but these e-values can help out there because basically what you can do is you can, um, you can actually put in subjective ingredients into that description uh, method, which is kind of you have to, because if you use different description methods, you get very different results. 
but you can then kind of factor them out again if you look at the final results. So what will happen if um, if you use it then to get these to get these anytime valid confidence intervals? If you use kind of a silly description for your parameters, your confidence intervals don't get wrong, but they get extremely wide. So there. There, we did find a solution, but it, again, it's too technical to say briefly, but there, we found a solution for exactly this problem in a way that you can somehow, you can see in the data that somehow what you're doing might not be very clever for this data. And it, 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 the result is that your conclusions become not wrong, but they become very weak. Um, so it, very roughly, it's like you take, you look at a, a big set of different ways of describing these thetas at the same time, and you take the worst case of them. And that's the worst case will kind of make your uncertainty bigger. But it is definitely an issue, yeah. All right, let's uh, thank Peter.